Doug. And if we win, we get to tell you how Liberty Mutual customizes car insurance, so you only pay for what you need. Isn't that what you just did? Service! Stand back, yeah! I'm gonna show you. Time out. Only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 liberty. There are many reasons for waiting to visit your doctor right now. But if you're experiencing irregular heartbeat, heart racing, chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, or lightheadedness, don't wait to contact your doctor because these symptoms could be signs of a serious condition like atrial fibrillation, which could make you about five times more likely to have a stroke. Your symptoms can mean something serious, so this is no time to wait. Talk to a doctor by phone, online, or in person. KUAM News, winner of the 2020 Regional Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Social Media. Tokyo 21, presented locally by IT&E. Today, welcome to Weekend Edition. I'm Tyler Matanani. Glad you could join us. The oversight chair of the Port Authority is diving into the agency's hiring practices, but she's not only interested in looking into the current administration's hiring practices, but apparently that of the agency's predecessor, who also is one of her colleagues in the 36th Guam Legislature. I don't know why they picked the particular dates they have. I don't know why they didn't go back to 2010 or 2011. Senator Talina Nelson serves as oversight over the Port Authority of Guam, and she's looking into more than just the hiring practices of sitting Port General Manager Rory Respicio, but of her colleague in the 36th, Senator Joanne Brown. According to a letter from Senator Nelson to the Civil Service Commission, she wants a post-audit of the hiring practices of employees with any criminal history hired by the port from fiscal years 2017 to 2020. That would cover a portion of the time when Senator Brown was the port's general manager. Certainly for me, uh, if they have a specific reason as to why, and I've heard some comments being made uh, that, you know, they, there may have been individuals hired, I, I hope uh, they can reference official misconduct if that's what they're looking at. Uh, but with regards to that particular issue, I certainly uh, would never have knowingly hired anyone who had a questionable history. Senator Brown says to her knowledge, she did not hire anyone with a criminal record during her tenure. She does recall, however, terminating a longtime employee after it was brought to her attention that he had a felony conviction. Brown clarifying that this particular employee was at the port years before she was the general manager. They certainly can look and are welcome to do so. I stand by my position as general manager and all my actions during my time there. I mean, I had zero tolerance for drugs. Senator Nelson's call for the post audit follows concerns raised about the hiring of former DOC officer Frankie Roslin as program coordinator too at the port. In 2019, he pled guilty to official misconduct as a misdemeanor for his role in the 2017 drug conspiracy case at the prison. Rosalind is the boyfriend of Lieutenant Governor's sister. After the hiring was brought to light, Senator Brown introduced Bill 37, which would bar anyone convicted of official misconduct from working for Gov Guam. The Republican lawmaker has picked up support from her colleague, Senator James Moylan, who has signed on as co-sponsor. That's just wrong, and I'm, I applaud Senator Joanne Brown for uh, uh, pointing this out and finding the loophole. And I, especially now, we, we have the pandemic. We have over 27,000 people unemployed or lost wages who are looking to be gainfully employed one day. Uh, and we were so fortunate with the government of Guam to maintain uh, their employment during this pandemic when so many, so many others were, were not able to. Uh, so as Joanne Brown, had, uh, as Senator Brown has said, um, that, you know, we as government uh, employees, we, we had to, uh, you know, we had to take it 
uh, responsibilities and the people are really counting on us to make things right for them. The bill has been referred to a committee, but a public hearing date has not yet been scheduled. In the meantime, port officials return for a virtual information hearing next Tuesday at 9 a.m. on their drug-free workplace program policy, followed by an oversight hearing at 10 a.m. on the agency's recruitment and hiring practices. Port Authority General Manager Roy Respicio receives accolades from the Port Authority Board as they voted unanimously to give him an exceptional performance evaluation for the work he has done over the past year. During the board's recent meeting, Respicio asked for the discussions on his annual performance evaluation be held in open session for full transparency and also requested that no increment be included with his evaluation. The Port Board also approved exceptional performance evaluation for Deputy General Managers Luis Baza and Dominic Munia with no increments. With the rise of social media, people felt more and more comfortable sharing their opinions with the world. And since the start, the people of Guam have been voicing their concerns about transparency and accountability within our local government. But soon the people will have another outlet as the Guam Ethics Commission now has someone ready to take the helm. Executive Director of the Guam Ethics Commission, Jesse John Kenga. And I was fortunate to get the news. I was really excited that uh, I was selected and that we have this opportunity to get it uh, up and running and available for the people of Guam. There's an obvious call by our community to want to have a more transparent and accountable government. And so uh, just my career, my educational background has always been about how do we provide for a better government of Guam, a more honest and transparent government. And I thought that this was probably ground zero to get that done. And According to Kenga, the commission is aiming at mid-year to start taking complaints from the public, but says they've got to get all their ducks in a row before that happens. This is the goal, and uh, I know once I am there on day one, I'm going to hit the ground running. We want to make sure that we have everything in place before, though, uh, we can start to accept complaints. I mean... Uh, for us, our biggest concern is when complaints start to come in, that our process is fully vetted so that we understand those complaints are going to be uh, accountable from the time they enter our office and transparent all the way until they leave with the decision by the commission. Uh, if we don't have that in place, it will present a great challenge, not just to us, but the community. I'm for Kenga's full interview, head over to youtube.com slash KUAM News. A handful of grand jury indictments came down this week with a majority of individuals facing drug possession charges. The Office of the Attorney General issued the, the court documents in a mass email of the separate cases. The Superior Court of Guam Grand Jury charges Peter John Yamaguchi Mingiola with possession of a Schedule II controlled substance as a third-degree felony. Mingiola allegedly committed the offense on January 13, 2021. On that same day, officers arrested Wilson Esma for a separate offense. Esma was indicted for criminal mischief as a third-degree felony, criminal mischief as a misdemeanor, family violence as a misdemeanor, and two counts of harassment as a petty misdemeanor. According to court documents, the defendant intentionally damaged a motor vehicle and placed a family member in danger. S.J. Aranga faces possession of a Schedule II controlled substance as a third-degree felony. According to court documents, the offense was committed on January 16th and was a felony while on a felony release. Billy Ray Quintanita was indicted for identity theft as a third-degree felony, theft as a third-degree felony, and theft as a misdemeanor. Court documents state Quintanita committed the impersonation offense for two days in October 2020. John Paul Tapasna Santiago faces two counts of felony vehicle identification as a third-degree felony and two counts of vehicle without identification as a misdemeanor. Santiago allegedly committed the offense on April 10, 2020, then again on April 24, 2020. Matechi Kitsu was indicted on possession of a Schedule II controlled substance as a third-degree felony. He was arrested for allegedly committing the offense on May 5, 2020. Jacob Anthony Cepeda Duenas faces possession of a Schedule II controlled substance as a third-degree felony for allegedly committing the offense on May 30, 2020. That same day, D1 Ibrahim, also known as Duane, was arrested on drug charges. He was indicted for possession of a Schedule II controlled substance and operating a motor vehicle without a valid driver's license as a violation. 
Tino Salomon faces similar charges for a separate crime. He was indicted on possession of a Schedule II controlled substance as a third degree felony and operating a motor vehicle without a valid driver's license as a violation. Salomon allegedly committed the offense on October 17, 2020. A grand jury indictment charges Justin J. Nettedog Perez with possession of a Schedule II controlled substance as a third degree felony and operating a motor vehicle without a valid driver's license as a violation. According to court documents, the offense occurred on September 21, 2020. In education news, the Catholic School Superintendent Dr. Juan Flores reported that some schools are seeing a return of up to 90% of students for face to face instruction. The one thing about the Catholic schools is we can't wait um, or hope for things to happen. We've got to go out and make it happen. And I think the schools did their best to encourage the families to send their kids back to school. The vast majority of Catholic, Catholic elementary middle schools have students on campus every day. Two Catholic high schools have chosen to continue online learning until February, while the rest operate through alternating schedules. Dr. Flores says that they are hoping that parents that have chosen to continue distance learning for their children will see the school's commitment to providing a healthy and safe environment. He also expressed his frustration over additional supplies that are to be provided through care Act funding that have been stuck in the procurement process. I've heard from vendors themselves that as soon as they get the word, they're calling their suppliers and things are going to get sent out. So, you know, the, the notion that they're going to wait from August to January for those water dispensers, I'm not sure I understand that because some of our schools got those things on their own. Um, and were able to procure them. They spent their own money procuring them because they did not wait, want to wait. And that's what's happened to some of our schools. If they had the funds, they went out and bought sneeze guards. They went out and bought filters for themselves, uh, for their schools. Moving forward, one of the top focuses is figuring out how to fully prepare students for the next grade based on current learning circumstances. Maximizing class time and days of instruction are just some of the approaches schools will be taking to ensure students are well equipped for the following year. Vaccination of faculty and staff also remains a top priority. Bank of Guam officially closed two of its branches in preparation of the start of something new. The Dededo and Harmon branches shut down after nearly 40 years of serving the northern community, according to bank release. Uh, bank of Guam has been beefing up its digital banking capabilities over the years, which has been in demand during the pandemic. The start of something new promises a forward thinking, integrated approach to the experience offered to their customers, bridging a legacy of personalized services along the leading edge conveniences of digital banking. The Guam Public Library System announced a third branch will be back online starting Monday. Southern residents will be able to check out books at the Rosa Regis Memorial Library in Maritsu on Mondays and Wednesdays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Keep in mind it will be closed for lunch for one hour beginning at 12 noon. Additionally, only limited services are being offered such as borrowing, browsing, returning, computer, laptop, and internet usage with limited printing. Before you are allowed inside, temperature checks and completion of contact tracing forms are mandatory. And of course, you must wear a mask. The Marito Library joins the one in Hagania and Bergado, which have already reopened. Stay tuned, next on Weekend Edition, we have trend spotting. And still to come, the Guam Crime Stoppers Report. Get up to the minute news, plus access to alerts, streaming radio, promotions, and more on your mobile device by downloading the KUAM News mobile app, available at the App Store now.
makes myself and it makes my team members very proud to work for an organization that has been on island for many years with its focus on reliability, dependability, and commitment to the communities that they operate in. Matson's a great corporate citizen to the community. We all benefit from any sort of environmental commitment we make. One of the ways that we do that is with our Adahi Utano program. There's action behind it, and so action breeds commitment. With the Kaimana Gila coming to Guam, this brings a new age and modernization to the island. It's exciting for me because it's a brand new ship and we can carry more freight into the islands. It just shows growth for Guam and Micronesia. Matson would be nothing without its customers, and we hope to continue to serve you for decades to come. Wait, what? It's practically February. The days are flying and so is the news. On your radar this week, a prominent priest has officially been stripped of his title, the arrest of a man who allegedly shot and killed his friend, and much more. I'm Peter Santos, and here's your trend spotting report. We began the week with a big arrest made in a fatal shooting among friends. 37-year-old Larry Gagan was arrested on murder and gun charges. On January 24th, police responded to a home on Waisengsong Road in Dedido, where 40-year-old Jericho Nchanko was found shot. Sadly, Nchanko later died of his injuries at the Guam Regional Medical City. The next day, police picked up Gagan for the crime. According to court documents, the pair were friends and Gagan even gave Nchanko a place to stay when he became homeless. But on the day of the shooting, Nchanko was allegedly arguing with Gagan's wife and others. Gagan then appeared at the home and allegedly shot Nchanko in the back. Bail for Gagan was set at $250,000. Here are some comments. Lillian May 64 said, It's scary with all this happening on our island and people gone missing. ECFRGU32 said, That guy was an aide in my elementary school. Dog, what happened? And Franche said, Bruh, what happened to Mr. Larry? Now, according to court documents, Gagan had a gun for protection, the one he used to allegedly kill Unchanko. But he doesn't have a gun license and the weapon wasn't registered to him. So we asked you, do you think we need stricter gun laws? 65% of you said yes, while 35 said no. Also this week, the Archdiocese announced it had formally stripped its former chancellor of his title and duties. Adrian Cristobal was a longtime priest who hasn't returned to Guam since sexual abuse allegations against him surfaced. Now that he's been officially laicized or defrocked, Cristobal has been cut off from church financial support. He can't hold any clerical positions or powers, can't wear any church garb, and he can't be addressed with any titles like father or reverend. A lot of you responded online to this story, still upset at the former priest's alleged crimes. Roki and Kanko said the devil in church clothing. Wonder how many more are still slithering around the churches. Sad. Ruth Pablo Gagnon chimed in with, You should really know how to pray, right? Pray for yourself. And short and simple, Joseph Cummings said, Binetsu. More crime stories kept you talking this week, including the problem Tumuning has been having with a recent rash of burglaries. Last week, KUM spoke with the village mayor who says she hopes to revamp the neighborhood watch program and tackle this painful issue. Yet the robberies keep on coming. On social media, KUM shared a video clip and an image of an unknown man boldly entering a Tumuning resident's garage. Police continue to search for the man and others who are responsible for the numerous car break-ins and home burglaries. If you have any information on these events, call the police or the Guam Crime Stoppers. Lots of you had plenty to say, including Suntos, who said, Another freaking lowlife with no respect for people's property. Not my key, who said, How Jonestown getting sweet that easily? No security? And we're going to leave you with some images of military service members that got lots of attention online this week. Volunteers from the Anderson Air Force Base Sister Village Sister Squadron program worked alongside the Agate Mayor's Office staff in a major cleanup at Ocean View Middle. The service members spent four hours hauling and clearing out debris in preparation for students' return to campus. Great job and thank you to all those who pitched in. Don't forget, come Monday, more restrictions are going to be lifted, but that doesn't mean we're going to slack on our safety. Remember to wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear your mask. Till next time, adios. Social distancing may be the new norm, but connection will always be our tradition. Through good times and tough times, we remain connected with you. Mass may be the new fashion, but protection will always be our style. You can always count on us to protect the things that matter the most. 
Sanitizing may be the new routine, but caring will always be our practice. We care about your loved ones and the things you value the most. And as we welcome our new normal, one thing remains certain, we will always be here for you. We're open and ready to serve you. Calvo's Insurance, a legacy of trust. Guam's Auto Appearance Specialist, Elegant Reflections, has been providing the automotive industry with professional detailing and car care products at its highest quality from complete detailing, full interior detailing, exterior detailing, headlamp restoration, hand washing, seat and carpet shampoo, engine degreasing, undercarriage cleaning, paint sealant, fabric protection, paint oxidation removal, and so much more. Visit us at our new location. Call 646-5555 for an appointment. Elegant Reflections, Guam's Auto Appearance Specialist, over 20 years of experience. Here with me, President of the Guam National Olympic Committee, Rick Bloss. Now, the IOC sent out a press release ensuring the world that they're doing everything they can to make sure the 2021 Olympic Games uh, goes down, having conversations with uh, the International Olympic Committee. Well, we had a, uh, an official conference call last Friday evening, and that's with all the English-speaking uh, countries. So, and the message from the IOC was very positive uh, with the direction, uh, considering that last Thursday and Friday, um, we were receiving a lot of inquiries from um, the Japanese media, which are basically ignored because, you know, uh, any, any comments made that might badly reflect on the Olympic movement can also be further uh, misconstrued by the general public because if you read what is happening in Japan, they want the IOC and, and the Tokyo government to cancel the games. Um, I think after one year of this uh, COVID condition, I think it's, it's uh, given the opportunity for the organizing committee, the Tokyo government and the IOC to formulate a plan to move the games forward, uh, understanding that there are still conditions out there that might further compromise. But the organizing committee, based on the uh, presentation made by a very good friend of mine, the new uh, Olympic Committee president from uh, the Tokyo uh, Olympic Committee, uh, Yasuhiro Yamasa, and, you know, the message is clear. They're ready to receive the, uh, the world community, sporting community. Uh, they look forward. Uh, but they also made it clear that there are going to be conditions that are going to be set by both the IOC and the organizing committee uh, to safeguard all the athletes and support group that are coming for the games. Well, the games are six months away. Uh, what's the word on the venues, athletes, village, or quarantine well you know they they did talk about venue wise uh they're still debating if they're going to allow spectators in or not if they do what percentage are going to be allowed in is it 50 percent or 20 percent very much as you see in uh in the nfl uh up until the playoff games uh the last couple of days where you see more uh audience in the in the stadium um I, I don't know what that will uh, come to, uh, but I'm pretty sure that they'll decide what's in the best interest. And again, it's to protect the athletes. So whatever safeguards are going to be taken care, uh, taken by the organizing committee is what we all have to uh, abide by. So that's on the venue. Uh, the Games Village, uh, my understanding is that they're not going to allow athletes to venture outside of the Games Village. They're going to keep them confined. They don't want to expose athletes to the outside community uh, with the potential of them having to bring back uh, the virus. So, and, and that's understandable. But you know, many athletes are going to probably wonder why come to the Olympic Games if they can't venture out. 
we're not living in normal conditions as we normally did. This is under COVID uh, conditions, and we have to respect the rules that are being uh, given to us, and that's to govern our presence in uh, Tokyo. Has anything changed with the qualifications for athletes? It has. Uh, in some sports, it has opened up more slots, uh, primarily because Russia has been taken out of the equation due to their doping offense. However, those athletes can still qualify, but they will most likely compete under the Olympic flag. What are the federations here on island saying about their readiness for the Olympic Games when it comes to their athletes? Well, they're doing their best. Uh, I've been primarily been in contact with uh, the federation leadership. Um, they're doing their best. You know, the fact that the closure of the pool uh, doesn't make it any easier for uh, our lone female athlete. Uh, for the male athlete, at least he's able to be, to use uh, St. John's, I believe. We're still trying to find an, a, a solution for the female athlete to use a, a swimming pool. Um, it's kind of untimely that they close the Hagatnia pool. The only pool that's, that's suitable to uh, allow athletes to train whether for the Olympic Games or the, or for the Pacific Games that are coming up. So I kind of, I, I know it was a hard decision by government, but they could have waited some time until this matter is all uh, resolved. The last time we spoke, we talked about uh, potential athletes leaving to Japan a little early to get in some training with some top coaches and just just to get settled in, any time frame on when the athletes be heading out to uh, Japan? Mike is my go-to person uh, for Fukuoka. Fukuoka is our training camp. We were scheduled to focus on the first part of February to move an Oceania delegation into Fukuoka. But two weeks ago, Fukuoka notified us that they just shut down their borders because of a high rise of the virus. So, now we're back to square one. We've got to wait and see what are the conditions. And even if we move our athletes in, Fukuoka has made it known to us that the government restricts any contact of our athletes and their local community. So it puts a, uh, a bigger problem on, uh, on us trying to get our athletes uh, to be ready for the Olympic Games. And in particular, you know, going back with our, our delegation here in Guam, the athletes in the Federation are doing their best. And they can only do with what's given to us in terms of government uh, control protocols to allow us to, to train and prepare for the games. And, you know, it's, it's not a bad uh, raising question on, on the, government, uh, the governor's decision. She's got the hard task of trying to make the right decision for all of us uh, to fall under those safeguard conditions, and we respect that. Close out the news tonight, our latest round of birthday shout outs from the Coldstone Creamery Birthday Club. All right, everybody, Saturday and Sunday, of course, start with the letter S. And you know what else does? Shout outs. And so we are sending happy birthday love to Jesse Sablon. Happy birthday to our dad and papa, Jesse. We love you, said your family. Also on Saturday, Amaya Uggen. Happy birthday to you, coming from mom and the family. Then on the last day of Sunday, 
Wankner Villain. Happy blessed birthday. Your family loves you very, very much. We hope you have a fantastic Sunday and a fantastic birthday. And Kelly Marie Garcia celebrates a birthday on Sunday the 31st. Happy birthday to you from mommy, daddy, and the whole family. They say we love you so much. So all of you have a great island weekend and have a fantastic island birthday. Remember, you can be part of the Cold Stone Creamery Birthday Club by registering online at KUM.com. Please make sure to include with your photo your name and birth date. That's all the time we have from all of us here at Guam's News Network. Thanks for watching and have a safe weekend.